Good news, children. Um, we will continue from where we left off, and this is Matilda. I'll just read the last paragraph that we stopped on, okay? Very well, Miss Honey, Matilda said. Thank you so much for getting those books for me. What a nice child she is, Miss Honey thought. I don't care what her father said about her. She seems very quiet and gentle to me, and not a bit stuck up. In spite of her brilliance, in fact, she hardly seems aware of it. So when the class reassembled, Matilda went to her desk and began to study a book on geometry, which Miss Honey had given to her. The teacher kept half um, an eye on her all the time and noticed that the child very soon became deeply absorbed in the book. She never glanced up once during the entire lesson. Miss Honey, meanwhile, was making another decision. She was deciding that she would go herself and have a secret talk with Matilda's father, uh, mother and father as soon as possible. She simply refused to let the matter rest where it was. The whole thing was ridiculous. She couldn't believe that the parents were totally unaware of their daughter's remarkable talents. After all, Mr Wormwood was a successful motor car dealer, so she presumed that he was a fairly intelligent man himself. In any event, parents never underestimated the abilities of their own children. Quite the reverse. Sometimes it was well nigh impossible for a teacher to convince the proud father or mother that their beloved offspring was a complete nitwit. Miss Honey felt confident that she would have no difficulty in convincing Mr and Mrs Wormwood that Matilda was something very special indeed. The trouble was going to be to stop them from getting over-enthusiastic. And now Miss Honey's hopes began to expand even further. She started wondering whether permission might not be sought from the parents for her to give private tuition to Matilda after school. The prospect of coaching a child as bright as this appealed enormously to her professional instinct as a teacher. And suddenly, she decided that she would go and call on Mr and Mrs Wormwood that evening. She would go fairly late, between 9 and 10 o'clock, when Matilda was sure to be in bed. And that is precisely what she did. Having got the address from the school records, Miss Honey set out to walk from her own home to the Wormwood's house shortly after 9. She found the house in a pleasant street where each smallish building was separated from its neighbours by a bit of garden. It was a modern-day brick house that could not have been cheap to buy, and the name on the gate said Cozy Nook. Nosy Cook might have been better, Miss Honey thought. She was given to playing with words in that way. She walked up the path and rang the bell, and while she stood waiting, she could hear the television blaring inside. The door was opened by a small, ratty-looking man with a thin, ratty moustache who was wearing a sports coat that had an orange and red stripe in the material. Yes, he said, peering out at Miss Honey. If you're selling raffle tickets, I don't want any. I'm not, Miss Honey said, and please forgive me for butting in on you like this. I am Matilda's teacher at school, and it is important that I have a word with you and your wife. Got into trouble already, has she? Mr Wormwood said, blocking the doorway. Well, she is your responsibility from now on. You will have to deal with her. She is no trouble at all, Miss Honey said. I have come with good news about her. Quite startling news, Mr Wormwood. Do you think I might come in for a few minutes and talk to you about Matilda? We are right in the middle of watching one of our favourite programmes, Mr Wormwood said. This is most inconvenient. Why don't you come back some other time? Miss Honey began to lose patience. Mr Wormwood, she said, if you think some rotten TV programme is more important than your daughter's future, then you ought not to be a parent. Why don't you switch the darn thing off and listen to me? That shook Mr Wormwood. He was not used to being spoken to in this way. He peered carefully at the slim, frail woman who stood so resolutely out on the porch. Oh, well, very well then, he snapped. Come on in and let's get it over with. Miss Honey stepped briskly inside. Mrs Wormwood isn't going to thank you for this, the man said, as he led her into the sitting room, where a large, platinum blonde woman was gazing rapturously at the TV screen. Who is it, the woman said, not looking around. Some school teacher, Mr. Wormwood said, she says she's got to talk to us about Matilda. He crossed to the TV set and turned down the sound, but left the picture on the screen. Don't do that, Harry, Mrs. Wormwood cried out. Willard is just about to propose to Angelica. You can still watch it while we're talking, Mr. Wormwood said. This is Matilda's teacher. She says she's got some sort of news to give us. My name is Jennifer Honey, Miss Honey said. How do you do, Miss Wormwood? Mrs. Wormwood glared at her and said, What's the trouble then? 
Nobody invited Miss Henny to sit down, so she chose a chair and sat down anywhere. This, she said, was your daughter's first day at school. We know that, Mrs Wormwood said, ratty about missing her programme. Is that all you came to tell me? Miss Honey stared hard into the other woman's wet grey eyes, and she allowed the silence to hang in the air until Mrs Wormwood beca became uncomfortable. Do you wish me to explain why I came, she said. Get on with it then, Mrs Wormwood said. I'm sure you know, Miss Honey said, that children in the bottom class at school are not expected to be able to read or spell or juggle with numbers when they first arrive. Five-year-olds cannot do that, but Matilda can do it all, and if I am to believe her, I wouldn't, Miss Wormwood said. She was still ratty at losing the sound on the TV. Was she lying then, Miss Honey, he said, when she told me that nobody taught her to multiply or to read. Did either of you teach her? Teach her what, Mr Wormwood said. To read, to read books, Miss Honey said. Perhaps you did teach her. Perhaps she was lying. Perhaps she has shelves full of books all over the house. I wouldn't know. Perhaps you're both great readers. Of course we read, Mr Wormwood said. Don't be so daft. I read the autocar motor from cover to cover every week. This child has already read an astonishing number of books, Miss Honey said. I was simply trying to find out if she came from a family that loved good literature. We don't hold with book reading, Mr Wormwood said. You can't make a living from sitting on your fanny and reading storybooks. We don't keep them in the house. I see, Miss Honey said. Well, all I came to tell you was that Matilda has a brilliant mind, but I expect you knew that already. Of course I knew she could read, the mother said. She spends her life up in her room buried in some silly book. But does it not intrigue you, Miss Honey said, that a little five-year-old is reading long adult novels by Dickens and Hemingway? Doesn't that make you jump up and down with excitement? Not particularly, the mother said. I'm not in favour of blue-stocking girls. A girl should think about making herself look attractive so she can get a good husband later on. Looks is more important than books, Miss Hunky. The name is Honey, Miss Honey said. Now look at me, Mrs Wormwood said. Then look at you. You chose books, I chose looks. Miss Honey looked at the plain, plump person with a smug, sweet pudding face who was sitting across the room. What did you say, she asked. I said, you chose books and I chose looks, Mrs Wormwood said. And who's finished up the better off? Me, of course. I'm sitting pretty in a nice house with a successful businessman and you're left slaving away teaching a lot of nasty little children the ABC. Quite right, Sugar Plum, Mr Wormwood said, casting a look of such simpering sloppiness at his wife, it would have made a cat sick. Miss Honey decided that if she was going to get anywhere with these people, she must not lose her temper. I haven't told you all of it yet, she said. Matilda, as far as I can gather at this early stage, is also a kind of mathematical genius. She can multiply complicated figures in her head like lightning. What's the point of that when you can buy a calculator, Mr Wormwood said. A girl doesn't get a man by being brainy, Mrs Wormwood said. Look at that film star, for instance, she added, pointing at the silent TV screen where a bosomy female was being embraced by a craggy actor in the moonlight. You don't think she got him to do that by multiplying figures at him, do you? Not likely. And now he's going to marry her. You see if he doesn't. And she's going to live in a mansion with a butler and lots of maids. Miss Honey could hardly believe what she was hearing. She had heard that parents like this existed all over the place and that their children turned out to be delinquents and dropouts. It was still a shock to meet a pair of them in the flesh. Matilda's trouble, she said, trying once again, is that she is so far ahead of everyone else around her that it might be worth thinking about some kind of extra private tuition. I seriously believe she could be brought up to university standard in two or three years with the proper coaching. University, Mr Wormwood shouted, bouncing up in his chair. Who wants to go to university, for heaven's sake? All they learn there is bad habits. That's not true, Miss Honey said. If you had a heart attack this minute and had to call a doctor, that doctor would be a university graduate. If you got sued for selling someone a rotten second-hand car, you'd have to get a lawyer, and he'd be a university graduate too. Do not despise clever people, Mr Wormwood. But I can see we're not going to agree. I'm sorry I burst in on you like this. Miss Honey rose from her chair and walked out the room. Mr Wormwood followed her to the followed her to the front door and said, Good of you to come, Miss Hawkes. Or is it Miss Harris? It's neither, Miss Honey said, but let it go. And away she went, throwing the hammer. The nice thing about Matilda was that if you had met her casually and talked to her, you would have thought she was a perfectly normal five-and-a-half-year-old child. 
She displayed almost no outward signs of her brilliance, and she never showed off. This is a very sensible and quiet little girl, you'd have said to yourself. And unless for some reason you had started a discussion with her about literature or mathematics, you would never have known the extent of her brain power. It was therefore easy for Matilda to make friends with other, fr other children. All those in the class liked her. They knew, of course, that she was clever because they had heard her being questioned by Miss Honey on the first day of term. And they also knew she was allowed to sit quietly with a book during lessons and not pay attention to the teacher. But children of their age do not search deeply for reasons. They are far too wrapped up in their own small struggles to worry or to worry over much about what others are doing and why. Among Matilda's newfound friends was the girl that called Lavender. Right from the first day of term, the two of them started wandering around together during the morning break and in the lunch hour. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age, a skinny little nymph with deep brown eyes and with dark hair that was cut in a fringe across her forehead. Matilda liked her because she was gutsy and adventurous. She liked Matilda for exactly the same reasons. Before the first week of term was up, awesome tales about the headmistress, Miss Trunchbull, began to filter through to the newcomers. Matilda and Lavender, standing in a corner of the playground during morning break on the third day, were approached by a rugged ten-year-old with a boil on her nose called Hortensia. New scum, I suppose, Hortensia said to them, looking down from her great height. She was eating from an extra large bag of potato chip crisps and digging the stuff out in handfuls. Welcome to Borstal, she added, spraying bits of crisp out of her mouth like snowflakes. The two tiny ones confronted by this giant kept a watchful silence. We've seen her at prayers, Lavender said, but we haven't met her. You've got a treat coming to you, Hortensia said. She hates very small children. She therefore loathes the bottom class and everyone in it. She thinks five-year-olds are grubs that haven't had yet hatched out. In went another fistful of crisps, and when she spoke again, out sprayed the crumbs. If you survive your first year, you may just manage to live through the rest of your time here. But many don't survive. They get carried out on stretcher screaming. I've seen it often. Hortensia paused to observe the effect of these remarks. Hortensia paused to see what kind of effect they were having on the two itchy ones. Not very much. They seemed pretty cool, so the large one decided to regale them with further information. I suppose you know the trench bowl has a lock-up cupboard in a private quarters called the Chalky. Have you heard about the Chalky? Matilda and Lavender shook their heads and continued to gaze up at the giant. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they were, especially senior girls. The ch chalky, Hortensia went on, is a very tall but very narrow cupboard. The floor is only 10 inches square, so you can't sit down or squat in it. You have to stand. And three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at attention all the time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible. Can't you lean against the door, Matilda asked. Don't be daft, Hortensia said. The door's got thousands of sharp, spiky nails sticking out of it. They've been hammered through from the outside, probably by the trench bull herself. Have you ever been in there? Lavinda asked. My first term, I was in there six times, Hortensia said. Twice for a whole day and the other times for two hours each. But two hours is quite bad enough. It's pitch dark and you have to stand up dead straight. And if you wobble at all, you get spiked either by the glass or the walls or the nails on the door. Why were you put in? Matilda asked. What had you done? The first time, Hortensia said, I poured half a tin of golden syrup onto the seat of the chair the trench bull was going to sit on at prayers. It was wonderful. When she lowered herself into the chair, there was a loud squelching noise similar to that made by hippopotamus when lowering its foot into the mud and on the banks of the Limpompo River. But you're too small and stupid to have read the just-so stories, aren't you? I've read them, Matilda said. Right, we'll stop here because we're running out of time. But we shall finish, uh, continue on with this next week. So I'll see you then. I hope you enjoyed that.